Stephen J. Gold. So he he was one of the uh, prominent evolutionary biologists of uh, 20th century and even 21st century, isn't it? Uh, he was from Harvard University. Only very few evolutionary biologists have escaped beyond what Darwin said. You know, so Darwinian legacy, which is uh, usually known as adaptationist paradigm. Uh, the term is introduced by Stephen J. Gould himself. So only very few uh, biologists have gone beyond what Darwin said. Uh, he is one among them. He was one of the pioneer. He was basically a Harvard paleontologist. So he worked on the fossil data and macroevolution, not really microevolution. And then, of course, he disagreed uh, with uh, Darwin's natural selection. But that doesn't mean that he was uh, supporting the creationism. Many people thought that not uh, that Stephen Jay Gould, whatever he says, is supporting the creation myth, which is incorrect. He was an evolutionary biologist, but he did not agree with the Darwin. Uh, on natural selection's prevalence. Of course, natural selection, he didn't disagree, but how big is the natural selection? That is uh, where the whole doubt is about, right? So still, there are, of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, evolutionary biologists who are stoned opponent of the Stephen Jay Gould as well. Uh, one of the contemporaries are, you know, the Richard Dawkins. Uh, they both are quite anti, right? The Dawkins were, uh, he was following the spirit of the Darwinism, while Stephen Jay Gould is entirely different. So, what exactly is his theory, uh, which we have described earlier earlier as well? No, Stephen Jay Gould's theory, which is in sync with the uh, uh, genetic drift and theory of neutral uh, evolution by Moto Kimura, right? So, he is best known today for the theory of punctuated equilibrium, along with Niels Eldridge, uh, his colleague at Harvard University. So, he put forth this theory in 1972, and he also authored. A very interesting, uh, you know, the essay, very, very well cited, more than uh, 8,000 citations till now. Spandrels of San Marco and Panglossian Paradigm, very philosophical and well written uh, essay, as well as The Mismeasure of Man, you know, one of my favorite book, The Mismeasure of the Man. So, this St Stephen Jay Gould is also very much into popular science writing. And he, his writing, uh, his prose is amazing. It's uh, as good as, uh, or I would say, an, an edge over the Richard Dawkins. So if you're interested to read this kind of general books to improve your prose and also to, to have a, a broader philosophical perspective of the biodiversity and evolution, I strongly recommend you to have a look at these books of uh, Stephen Jay Gould as well as this essay. Uh, the spandrels of, you know, it's very fancy sounding essay, right? Spandrels of San Marco and the Panglossian paradigm. Panglos is a character, Dr. Panglos uh, in, in Voltaire's uh, novella, Candide, you know, so that is what. So these are uh, the things, the main contribution of Stephen Jay Gould. He also did another contribution that is called Noma. So again, philosophically, the, the science deals with uh, objective truth, objective reality, while Ethics is quite different, right? I have said this topic again and again, you know, so science doesn't have uh, uh, any saying on the questions on the ethics, which is correct. Is it right or is it wrong? So science only tells you, uh, you know, what the reality is. For example, the atomic bomb, you know, so uh, nuclear fission is what the science said. But to develop a bomb or to use that energy for uh, power generation, this is up to us. So science, there is no right or wrong answer or abortion, you know, pro-choice or pro-life. So uh, out of pro-choice and pro-life, which is scientifically accurate, nothing, you know, the, because that, that is a question about ethics, you know. So ethics, of course, uh, your uh, religion is one of the ways that many people approach ethics, but again, that is an optional. Even if you don't follow any religion, you can still have your own virtues and your own code of ethics, right? So that is something different from the sciences, the realm of science. That is called the norma is about. So non-overlapping magisteria, the realms of science and realms of religion are in two Venn diagrams. There is nothing overlapping between that. That is a, you know, that is a very interesting thought of uh, Stephen Jay Gould. I think it's a very accurate and profound. I, I completely agree with that point. One of my favorite analogies is that you think of like one person standing in a tall building, fifth story, about to jump down. So scientists can only tell you that, uh, you know, if you jump, what is the probability of death? Very high. 
isn't it? But the scientist can never tell you, do not jump. Because to jump or not to jump doesn't fall in the purview of the science and scientific thinking. You know, so science is only about to know what the truth is, the reality, the objective reality. You know, but ethics is very different. What is right and what is wrong? You know, so that two things are not overlapping. And as I told you, this is one of his favorite, uh, I mean, famous, uh, you know, the essay, Spandrels of San Marco and Panglossian Paradigm, a critic of adaptationist program. I already told you adaptationist means, uh, you know, Darwin's theory, right? Uh, the problem is that after Darwin, every single evolutionary biologist start thinking, okay, this is the adaptationist function of it. What would be the evolutionary purpose of a trait? For example, there is a, a lotus have called pink color. So what would be the, the, the purpose of the pink color? Not the function, word, but the purpose. So as if every single trait has got an, a selective, uh, you know, advantage. The, the, everything is adaptation, which need not be, you know. So it could be simply random uh, traits. So randomness is completely gone out of question in adaptationist syndrome, isn't it? So... Spandrels are basically architectural artifacts, you know. Uh, San Marco is a famous cathedral in Italy and Pangloss is basically the, the uh, you know, the character in Candide of the Voltaire who is always looking for, op you know, uh, optimism, right? Uh, the good, uh, you know, uh, extremely optimist. So that is, the, that is how the Pangloss is all about. So it's, it's, a, it's a landmark essay in 1979. So the idea is that he, through this essay, he, he uh, uh, you know, he started descri describing a term called spandrel. So it's it's nothing but a byproduct, a characteristic that is byproduct of the evolution of some other characteristic rather than direct product of the adaptive selection or adaptive selection. So like in, in the church, if you go in, uh, you know, big, big church in the Europe, you will see that. Uh, three arch, right? One arch here, second arch here, and third arch or the ceiling, you know, the dome. So dome and two arch, in between there are actually shapes, the triangular uh, areas. So usually that area is of no use. But then the painters became super creative and a new genre of the painters started emerging. They are specialized in how to make use of this architectural space. Look at that. So here you can see that the, uh, you know, I think he he's Jesus, I don't know. But the, the Jesus, uh, you know, that um, leg is directly onto the corn, you see. And then other things. So it's all about the creative. The separate Jenner has started evolving to make use of this byproduct, you know. So it's not that the church were designed to have these spaces. No, the space is just the byproduct of uh, the architectural, uh, you know, movement for nice looking dome and two big arts right so that is what the the you know spandrels are so that he integrated this concept into the evolutionary bar oh these are all about the fancy uh, you know eloquence right the prose so that is what he's he's known for but anyway this is the idea right uh, it's a product right so it's uh, you know of course there is uh, other terms are acceptation uh, and extended phenotype right so all these are uh, you know, so uh, phenotype is not merely for uh, inside the body. It could be outside the extended phenotype, right? And acceptation means that the change in the trait. We have already explained it, right? Feather, you know, so uh, or the wings, right? So the, the, the trait, the function of the trait keep on changing. So again, these are related concepts, but not exactly the spandrel. Spandrel is completely a byproduct, you know. Examples include language, how the language evolved, culture, you know, cultural evolution. So uh, Richard Dawkins used to say that its meme is the basic unit of the cultural evolution. And study of meme, the memetics, you know, is about how the cultures evolve. Uh, you know, religion also could be, a, a, can be considered as a spandrel. You know, it's a byproduct of the human evolution. And are these only the byproduct or is it actually under the evolutionary constraints? All these are active questions, you know. So, yeah. Uh, you know that uh, linguistic evolution, I uh, I had this uh, project from ICSSR, Indian Council of Social Sci Science Research grant uh, called Tracing Evolution Legacy of Indian Languages Using Computational Phylogenetics. 
So the idea is that all these Indian language, 22 official languages, uh, you know, so we construct a data matrix of uh, the words, for example, salt, you know, so salt in most of the uh, Indo-Aryan language family, uh, like Hindi, it's Namak, right? And most of the Indo-Aryan, that family group are quite similar, you know, some variables, but ultimately it's something like Namak. But most of the Dravidian language have Uppu, very different. In Malayalam, it's Uppu, right? So as in Tamil. So, yeah, so if you construct a data set of these basic characters, you know, Swadesh character, there is, there is a term in linguistics. And then you apply the similar kind of phylogenetic reconstruction, like how we do that in DNA sequences like this. Then you can make, uh, you know, the, this, uh, how these are uh, genealogically interlinked. You know, so evolutionary legacy of these languages can be traced by similar concept of the phylogeny. You know, so there are a lot of interesting parallelism between biological evolution and linguistic evolution. Maybe it's because of the spandrels. You know, ling ling language evolution is a byproduct of the human evolution, you know. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we have homology or homologous character in linguists. Uh, they have cognates, you know, the same word with the same origin. Etymology, if you look, if the origin is same, then the, both the words are called cognate. For example, water and father, uh, Latin water and English father are cognates. Or mutation, uh, innovation. In, in linguistics, it is innovation. New, new words are being innovated, you know. Drift is same as, so as natural selection, but in the case of linguists, it's called social selection. You know, uh, uh, upper strata and lower strata in Malayalam, I, I know it very well that upper strata, upper caste people, uh, usually they mix Malayalam with Sanskrit, you know, and also a high standard magazines, you know, that, that kind of like, uh, if you say like in the normal Malayalam, that we call Pacha Malayalam, which is usually spoken by lower caste people. And if you try to get uh, uh, your prose written in Pacha Malayalam in uh, prestigious magazines like Madhrabhumi Archipadipu, they will not accept it uh, because they consider, okay, this is like a mediocre. Pacha Malayalam is, you know, there is no Sanskrit in it. You know, so <laughs> that's, that, is, that, is, that is what is happening in the case of languages too, you know. Yes, so horizontal gene transfer, like in bacteria and viruses. In languages, there is, you know, there is borrowing. Some words are borrowed from other languages, like switch, you know, or punch, punch on the face is actually from Hindi, you know, shampoo is also from Hindi. A lot of things which we, we really don't know unless we learn about the etymology, the origin of these words, you know. And plant hybrids like that, there is Creole languages like uh, Tulu, you know, in uh, 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 like Malayalam and uh, sense, uh, this uh, Kannada mix to form the Tulu, right? So that kind of things are there, right? And of course, geo geographic clients, little bit different in the client, uh, the, the, the organic evolution or biological evolution. In language, it is uh, dialects or dialectical chains and fossils. We have fossils in biology. In uh, linguists, they have uh, ancient texts, you know, an extinction event, of course, the language also die. Many of the languages have gone extinct, right? Like Proto-Dravidian is no, no longer being spoken, right? Uh, yes, so that is a very interesting parallelism. Now, Neil Seldridge and Stephen J. Gold are also known for punctuated equilibria, this theory. What is that punctuated? We have already introduced this concept earlier. So it is basically evolutionary development is marked by isolated episodes of rapid speciation between long period of little or no change here you can see this is a time for many millions of years there is no change and suddenly you see that rapid speciation is happening so long period of stasis so this is called stasis there is nothing is happening at this particular point sudden there are multiple new new species have been originated so what is happening here at this point why so much of the radiations happened Maybe because of the bottleneck, let us say, impact by a bloid, uh, you know, the meteorite that goes to the population bottleneck situation, right? Usually that is what the, the saltations happen. So saltations are sudden evolution, but for a long time, nothing happens and sudden evolution, you know? So very interesting. There is a non-linear pattern. 
At the same time, the Darwin's form is called phyletic gradualism. So it is very slow change and then uh, one species split into two, you know, so very, very slow process. But this one is actually very fast, uh, but only at uh, some time. So this is what you see when you look at the fossils. But this is what you see if you look at uh, DNA sequences, you know. So but again, this uh, thing is also seen in DNA sequences. The drift is very, very common. So as neutral evolution, you know. So <clears throat> this is in sync, this particular concept of the punctuated equilibria, punctuated as the name says, it's like punctuation mark, like semicolon, colon, or period, you know, that, that actually makes a lot of meanings, brings a lot of meanings to the sentences, isn't it? So like punctuation mark, uh, you know, these, these are the punctuated events called saltation, right? But mostly these are not changed at all, right? So there is, you know, that is what you call, or random walk, little bit left and right, like a, like a drunk card walking no random walk uh, no change virtually but suddenly there are a lot of changes so what is really happening at this time a sudden change or the the, the times of saltation is extinction event like this if you look at here the fossils the, or the layers of the rocks you know at this particular layer if you look there is no change at this layer and suddenly there is a difference uh, and in this one there is no change and suddenly there is another difference Right? So this is what, right? For here, you look at here, it's a lot of more dramatic. No change at all. And but then here and this are starkingly different, isn't it? This is what is very obvious in, in the case of uh, paleontology. So that is what the uh, you know theory of punctuated equilibria in a nutshell.